we're wondering how my colleague came by this bandage upon his head. It's very simple. A nurse put it on. <laughs> what my colleague is trying to say, if he had but the words, is that this afternoon he sustained an accident to his head. Vince, run that tape if you'd be so careful to do exactly as you're told. <laughs> I hereby declare this second episode of A Bit of Fry and Laurie open. <laughs> phew. Phew, me old Chinese meal. Um, I must ask you this. Uh, have you sustained any loss of memory as a result of that accident? And I think it's only fair to warn you that if you say what accident? I shall squirt lemon juice into you. Um, none whatever, which is a blessing. Oh, well, it is good news. I have lost my memory, though. <laughs> no. She's got eyes like diamonds, hair like twisted gold. When she looks up to me, I feel my blood run cold. No, I don't care if people laugh. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm in love with Steffi Graf. <laughs> I watched her all last summer. I watched her every day. She knew that I was with her. She didn't have to say. She can't run, but she can't hide She knows I feel deep down inside That Steffi is an angel But she folds her wings and walks like you and me She's extremely good at tennis On any kind of surface there might be Play your grass, she'll play your ass. <laughs> when she hits that top spin, second serve, I think I know the meaning now of love. <laughs> Eastbourne never was a favorite, the outside courts were down. She had a hamstring problem. And recurring muscle cramp But she dug deep and wanted just the same My angel never lost a service game But now a shadow in the distance A girl with ponytail Sixteen and full of hunger The end of Steffi's trail I can't wait for her dear feet I fetch your knife and take my seed <laughs> Cause Steffi is a goddess My love for her, it knows no bounds I kill to make her happy Or just to get her through the early round Kill all me If I had another life, I'd choose To come back as one of Steffi's shoes <laughs> Cause Steffi is an angel But she folds her wings and walks like you and me And welcome to Don't Be Dirty. <laughs> show that shows you don't have to be dirty. With us is Tony, three times semi finalist, and John, keen to be clean, who came through unexpectedly when last week's finalist, Mr. Nottingham, died in a canoe. <laughs> Tony, I'd like you to start first. Would you describe for us, Tony, please, the act of fellatio? That's the act, Tony, of fellatio without Tony, and I'm sure you must know the rules by now, without being dirty. And the time starts. Five seconds ago. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> this uh, is an act that takes place between two people, uh, possibly of opposite sexes, but possibly not. <laughs> Careful, tell me. Uh, whereby one of the <laughs> participants takes a part of the other participant's person into the place where they might more commonly keep bubble gum, say, and uh, proceeds to masticate. Oh, uh, Tony, I thought you were a goner there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until the other participant arrives at a state of uh, pleasurable relaxation. Uh, the second participant then gives the first participant ten quid and goes home. <laughs> Can no one beat this big man from Hunstanton? Well, John, it's up to you. Now, your topic is the preservation of hardwoods. <laughs> the time starts then. Well, this is a very necessary business operation. Uh, Tony's challenged. Uh, he said business. <gasps> you did say business, John, you did. A little bit dirty there. Minute away, but plenty of time to go. Operation that has to be carried out if developers are not to raise our hardwood forest. <laughs> Another challenge from our reigning champion. The nature of your challenge, Tony, he said. He said raise. He did say raise, Tony. Raise is an anagram of arse. Raise is an anagram of arse, Johnny. Tissy, tissy, tiss. So sorry, I'm afraid we have to lose you. You were keen to be clean, but you came up against a man very much at the top of his form. So sorry to say goodbye. Oh, piss. <laughs> Tony, you've been in this position before. You keep the £800 in weight. They're yours to keep, as of right. No one can take them away from you. But I'm offering you now another £600 plus an opportunity to go into our Don't Be Dirty Daily Double with a chance to win £10. I'll go for the Daily Double. I knew you'd say that, Tony. You're a sport. Quite a sport. But do remember that the prizes that you've won are yours to keep. They're yours. Yours alone. You're clear on that. Well, I'm clear on that badly, yes. All right, so long as you're clear on that, they're yours. No one else's, just yours. All right. Can we have the Don't Be Dirty Daily Double categories on the board, please? Your categories are rimming, <laughs> genital torture, <laughs> and David Vine. <laughs> now, remember, this is a Daily Double, so two subjects, tell me. I'll have to hurry you as you take your time. Just take your time very quickly. Uh, uh, genital torture and David Vine, please, Bradley. <clears throat> tell me. You have 30 Earth seconds in which to talk about genital torture and David Vine. And those 30 seconds, Tony, start... Oh, damn, just missed that one. <laughs> Coming up. It... <laughs> no! Uh, nipple clamps and uh, scrotal compressors are frequently deployed, as well as a variety of serrated needles, which are inserted into uh, parts of the body normally kept inside pants and best. Uh, presenting various sporting events, uh, most notably the World Snooker Finals from the Crucible Theatre Sheffield, David Vine combines uh, an easy, relaxed uh, presentational style with a clear expertise on the game. He also... Oh, Johnny! Johnny, you said on the game! Oh, you're dirty, Tommy, and that's a pity. I was, I was dirty. Shite-ass damn. <laughs> Only four seconds to go and you were dirty. Tony, I'm so sorry. It means you lose all the prizes you won last week and the prizes you won tonight. They're gone. They're not yours. They're lost. As of right, they're not yours anymore. I'm afraid you have to repay to us your travel expenses and you leave us empty-headed. But, Tony, you knew the risk. I did, Bradley. Yes, I knew the risk. Yes. But tell me this thing, Tony. Have you had a good time on Dolby Dirty? Have you enjoyed yourself? Has uh, it been a pleasure? It's, it's, been a, it's been a big one. Bradley, it's been a really, really big one. I've pleasured myself hugely. No, well, well, that's good to hear. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, we say goodbye. But do remember this. Don't, Don't be dirty. dirty. <laughs>
Ah. Oh, well, in that case, please accept my green felt apologies. <laughs> I, I, I just came in here to, to buy a model. A model? Yes. A model? Yes. A model? Yes. A model? Yes. That's right. I want to buy a model. With or without plastic struts? <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I, I thought maybe a model aeroplane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me ask a different question in the same way. Um, who is this aeroplane for? It's for my son. It's, it's his birthday. Your son? Yes. Just your son? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when is this birthday of his? Wednesday. Yes, that's what I said. When's the day? <laughs> no, Wednesday. Are you stupid or just plain dead? <laughs> Wednesday. Oh, you are genuinely stupid. I do apologize. <laughs> sorry, I thought you were just being deaf. Mr. Galliard, command the earth to swallow me up. I do apologize, sir. Life must be hard enough for stupid people without tactless old bastards like that lady over there rubbing it into your face with salt widely. Mr. Galliard, I've gone peculiar now. <laughs> so, in plain flavored English, when is your son's birthday? <laughs> The, the day after Tuesday. The day after... My word, doctors are so specific these days, aren't they? And are you expecting this boy to be a boy or a girl? <laughs> no, it's, it's my son. He's nine. This is going to be his tenth birthday. His tenth? Oh, sir, I fear you're spoiling him. I was only ever allowed one on my birthday, usually. Still, I guess you know your own business best. Just don't come bleating to Mr Dalliard and me if this son of yours turns out to be one of those drug jockeys we're always reading about on television. Um, a glass of water? No, thank you. A cup of water? No. A plate of water, then? No, 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 thank you. I just want a model aeroplane. A model aeroplane of water? No, no. I, <laughs> forget the, I don't want any water. Forget the water. I just want to buy a model aeroplane. I thought perhaps the Messerschmitt 109E in the window. The Messerschmitt 109E in the window. That's right. Mm -hmm. Fizzy or still? <laughs> what? Uh, that doesn't count. I had my hand on my head. <laughs> just ignore anything I say when my hand is on my head. Right. So, the Messerschmitt 109E. Yes, and uh, I suppose some glue. Some glue? Then your son is already a drug jockey. <laughs> Mr. Dalliard and I warned you on bended legs, but would you listen? No, no, look Hey ho. What's this? A uh, Messerschmitt 109E and a fix for that degenerate junkie son of yours. <laughs> but he's already done. Sir? Well, the model's ready assembled. Well, you can't expect us to do all the work ourselves, sir. The whole joy of modelling lies in carefully scraping off the paint, soaking off the transfer, <laughs> taking the plane apart piece by piece, putting each piece into a small polythene bag, which is then sealed and placed inside the box. An achievement, something to be proud of. Rare words indeed in these days of supersonic hedgehog brothers and ready-sliced golf shots. <laughs> That's it. Just forget it. Forget it. I'll, I'll, I'll try somewhere else. Mr. Deliard has a gun trained on you through the curtain, sir. At a single word from me, he will blow your head clean off with as much mercy as if you were a helpless seal pup called Arnold. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm so sorry we couldn't help you, sir. We do try to accommodate our customers, but not being a hotel, we find it almost impossible. <laughs> Right, well, all I can say is this has not been a very good morning. Good morning, Mr. Dalliard! Mr. Dalliard, you've been activated after all these years. You're a parent. You have children. You want those children to become Premier League footballers. Well, this is the place for you. The Dave Wilson School in Ipswich, in the heart of London's East End. Well, now, shake out, shake out. The name of Dave Wilson will be familiar to anyone who knows it and to those who followed the fortunes of Reading Town Reserves during the dark days of the 1970s. Oh, yeah, they were dark. They were, they were very, very dark days. I actually thought them was dark, but now that you mention it, they, they were ever so dark. Dave played in a total of two games for the side before a cartilage snapped in his head. <laughs> OK, next one. Following the accident, Dave tried his hand at many things. Astrologer, nightclub owner, interior designer, shadow home secretary. The jobs came and went, but nothing seemed to stick. Until Dave turned up one day to watch his nephew playing for the school side. Yeah, well, I saw a chance, you know, to get involved. Uh, you know, football's been good to me, and I, I saw a chance to do something back. <laughs> right, now, listen. OK, now, football is a very simple game. What is it? A very simple game. Right, now, what is the object of the game of football? Run into the box and fall over. Run into the box and fall over. <laughs> okay, let's try that now. One at a time, Ricky, off you go. <laughs> <laughs> right, 
I'm really trying to do here is to teach fundamental footballing skills at the earliest possible age. You know, I've actually started teaching my eight-month-old son, and I've got to say he's a natural. Falls over like a diamond. <laughs> now, listen. A lot of you, as you go, not getting your head back, OK? Nice and loose in the neck. As you get into the box, a lot of height goes like this, OK? <laughs> Applies for the static fall, right? That's when you run into the box, you've forgotten to fall over, you're just standing there, okay? Nice and loose in the neck and. <laughs> okay then, limping, two legs of the pitch, go. <laughs> Dance in the change room, what is it? Never you mind what that is. Right, you lot, come here! <laughs> Makes you sick, doesn't it? Right, listen, I'm going to say this once and once only, OK? Martin has found this in the changing room, right? Now then, I don't want to see any of you mucking around with these things, OK? Any one of you sees one of these, I want you to tell me or Mr Collins immediately, all right? You want to make it to the top, it's training. No one ever got on in football messing around with these things. Right, off you go. <laughs> this makes me sad. Hello, I'm Opera Winfrey, <laughs> and I'd like you to meet someone. Please say hello to Luella Della Twee. Hi. Tell us about yourself. Well, my name is Luella. Uh, I'm 37 years of age. Uh, I'm beautiful. I'm intelligent. I'm glamorous. I'm attractive. I'm warm. I'm sensitive. I'm caring. I'm rich. I'm sexy. <laughs> I'm, I'm incredibly talented. So, uh, what exactly is your problem, Luella? I suffer from low self-esteem. <laughs> mm. that's, uh, that's an absolute bugger, isn't it? Um, and how does that manifest itself? Well, I, I used to love myself. I used to think that I was great. Oh, don't tell me you stopped thinking you were great. That would be heartbreaking. <laughs> well, I, I, I stopped talking to myself. I stopped seeing myself for what I really am. I guess I, I started to take myself for granted. <laughs> Let's have a pointless round of applause there, can we? So, thank you. All right. So, uh, Luella, um, what did you do next? Well, I confronted myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I waited until I got home one day, and I confronted myself. I said, I said, hey, lady, what are you doing? You know? How unbearably tense. And um, <laughs> how did you respond? Well, you know, I started to shift around and started blaming all kinds of other things. But in the end, you know, I had to admit that, yes, I was sleeping with someone else. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been more emotionally knotted up than I am at the moment. Um, ask a question. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'd just like to ask Luella where she gets her strength from. Uh, Luella, lady here wants to know where the mascara ass you get your strength from. <laughs> well, now, can, can I answer that with a question? Can she? Oh, I'd like that. She'd like that. Uh, right, well, I, I want you to do something for me. I want you to stand in front of a mirror, OK? Take all your clothes off. Oh, no, every, no, no, hey, look, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, it's what I did, you know, I stood naked in front of a mirror and I looked to myself and I said, I love me. I love me for what I am. I love my whining aggression, you know, I love my hideous, suffocating self-pity. I, lo I love the fact that I'm a neurotic and that I demand the world's respect without having to do a single thing to earn it. I I'm me. I'm special. I'm, I'm crazy about the way I am. Now, will you do that for me? Hmm? I surely will. Right, well, I think we'd better take a vomit break now, but don't go away. <laughs> What you got in there? I'm sorry? What you got in there, I wonder? Uh, a cat. You've got a mog in there, have you? Got a kitty puss. <laughs> Lovely. This is Clover, my Daxie. I've always had Daxies. I like smooth-coated Daxies best. Really? Is that right? Mm. So, what sort of mogwog is your kitty puss? Hmm? <laughs> is it, um, uh, tabbles or a tom-tom or what? Burmese. Ah, oh, Burmy. I love a Burmy. Is it a girl or a boy Burmy? Oh, Christ. Uh, it's, um, <laughs> it's male. Hello, Mr. Burmy. What's your name, then? Yes, you can't speak, actually. <laughs> ah, but they can understand every word you say, can't they? Not much evidence for that. My first Daxie, my first ever Daxie, was called Scully. 
I named him after Hugh Scully, who presents the Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> I love that programme, don't you? Pervertedly. <laughs> do you know what I do of a Sunday? Every day after we've had our walk, because Clover and I always go walkings of a Sunday. Well, you know, just Clover and me, and of course my little pooper scooper. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, because that nasty parky man doesn't like to see Poochie Poop on his best grass, does he? <laughs> no, so. Oh, Christ. <laughs> And, of course, I don't like to see Poochie Poop on my best carpet, and if I do, Clover knows she can expect a visit from the smack fairy. <laughs> <laughs> so we come back, and I make myself a cheese and tomato toasty. A what? A cheese and what? Tomato. 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 Don't say it again. <laughs> I make myself a cheese and tommy toe toasty, sometimes two toasties, and an old muggles of tea, and I just snudge it down in front of the television and I watch the roadshow. Mm. I love my Sunday afternoonies. Jesus, God help. <laughs> and of course, if it isn't the roadshow, it might be that animal programme with Desmond. Desmond Morris. Ah, oh, yes, but we call him Desmond in our household because he's like a friend, he's like an old chum, is Desmond. <laughs> or we might watch MasterChef with Lloydie. Or the closey show with Jeff Banksy Wanksy. <laughs> we love our Sunday afters, don't we, Clover? <sighs> <laughs> so, what's wrong with Mr. Burmy? What? Mr. Burmy? Why is he coming to see Vetty Lou? Has he got a poorly tums? <laughs> Did you just say Vetty Lou? <laughs> Sore throaty? Hmm? What's the matter with Mr. Burmy? <laughs> I brought him in to be killed. <laughs> He? He's got cancer of the liver. I've brought him in to be put to death. Cancer? Yes. Cancer of the liver? Yes. Cancy wancy. Oh. <laughs> you got cancy diddlies then, have you, Mr. Burnley? You're going to be put to death, is, are you? Is your little heart going to be made to stoppy wop wop? Are they going to go killy chum chums? Are they going to put your coldy woldy body wad in the grandy wound, are they? <laughs> eh? Clover? Yeah? <laughs> what can I do for you? I'd like to have this man put down, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, See these? You plant one of these in about, um, oh, late July. A uh, bit of water, a bit of compost, a bit of love. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, about six months later, you've got a nine-lane motorway running through your back garden. <laughs> yes, I, I... I always remember this spot, because it was right here. Uh, this was the very first time that I saw my wife. Uh, was, oh, I was standing absolutely here, and I, I remember thinking, what an incredibly tiny woman she was. Absolutely tiny. She was about that size. <laughs> tiny little thing. It was only weeks later, as I got to know her, that I realised that that was, of course, because she was a long way away. <laughs> yeah. The things they say, eh? The things they say. My youngest, she said to me the other day, she said, Daddy, why are there wars? Why do people kill each other and fight? I said, Rebecca, darling, shut your face and watch the video or I'll belt you one. <laughs> Basically, I go around schools, uh, you know, I sit in with the kids, cos I'm trying to learn French. <laughs> I wear sophisticated clothes, I see sophisticated things. Everything about me says I'm a sophistication king, but when I'm with you, can't seem to find my cool. Yeah, when I'm with you, I just sit there and drool. <laughs> I got sophisticated hands, I got sophisticated feet. A sophisticated car parked on Sophistication Street But when I'm with you Can't seem to find my cool Yeah, when I'm with you I'm just a dribbling fool <laughs> When you look at me and you start to flirt I have to wipe the dribble off the front of my shirt <laughs> 
When you ask me what's on my mind, all I can think the answer is <laughs> I eat sophisticated food, I breathe sophisticated air, run a sophisticated comb through my sophisticated hair. But when I'm with you, can't seem to find my cool. Yeah, when I'm with you, I'm just a dribbling <laughs> fool. Ladies and gentlemen, a bit of a shadow has been cast over the show this evening. My colleague, Hugh, has received a death threat. That's right. Uh, it arrived this morning, uh, and it's addressed to dear sir or madam. And it goes like this. <laughs> you are a cow's son, bastard-sucking mental. <laughs> you die heavily in wet, throat-ripping everywhere. Don't like the Queen, this country. Spelt wrong. <laughs> For tear out lungs and replace with portable clothes, brackets, yes please, brackets. National service, who is she? Stripping scrotum through eerie, leery pastures of deep smell. <laughs> Pretty upsetting, as you can imagine. <laughs> I, I've tried to persuade Macaulay to take this threat seriously, but he insists on carrying on as if nothing has happened. Yeah, well, you see, I take the view that if you give in to these people, then... then you've given in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but at, at the very least, Macaulay, I don't think it's safe for you to do your song this evening. Well, you see, if I don't do my song, then he's won, and, and democracy might as well just take an early shower. <laughs> yes, but, but the, the, whoever he is, this, this, this M. Pontillo, I mean, he might... Uh, <laughs> you know, he might be in the audience now, armed. <laughs> Uh, but, you see, someone's got to take a stand. Look, McConig, I think we would all understand if you didn't do your song, you know? This Pontillo could be in the piano with a mobile rocket launcher, for all we know. <laughs> McConig, you must not sing tonight! What a, what a sweet man. McConig, I appreciate what you're trying to do, <laughs> you know, and I'm really touched by it, but, but my face is made up. You know, for, evil, <laughs> for evil to flourish, all that is required is for good men to spout clichés. I'm going on. <laughs> Well, ladies, and in a broader sense, gentlemen, as you've heard, my colleague has bravely decided to do his song this evening. It's 30 pence postage and package down the bloody drain, isn't it? <laughs> well, my colleague, 1,740 seconds have elapsed since first we welcomed the viewing several into our lives for another evening of entertainment and hatred. My colleague, you've opened your mouth and the great truth has come out. I'll save you embarrassment by pretending you never said that or anything like it. He's firm, but he's fair. In the great sandwich of broadcasting, we at a bit of fry and laurier, perhaps, but a thin slice of turkey breast. We nourish, but we don't cause wind. <laughs> I could have put it better myself. What more he could do? He could. <laughs> so now, my colleague, we have to sweep up the broken shards and decaying lumps of the evening, gather them into an old towel and heave them over the side. Fair breaks your heart, doesn't it? I turn to you now, my colleague, and I ask you to gaze down at the drinks menu and fix us a debonair cocktail selection. Oh, well, now this is a difficult choice. Choose carefully, my colleague. One choice brings certain death, the other freedom. <laughs> Well, now, you'd expect me to choose the silver prostate, but then you'd know that I'd know that you'd expect that. So, really, I should choose the boiling idiot. But the boiling idiot's got Campari in it, and he knows that I hate Campari, so... So? So, it'll be the silver prostate. Ha! You've chosen wisely, little one. Yoda has taught you well. <laughs> The silver prostate does indeed bring freedom. Now, to prepare a silver prostate at home, you will need seven of the following. A cocktail shaker, a cocktail shaker shaker, that's me, a helping of liquore strega, an assistance of parfait amour, lovely purple violet liqueur there, a tit of Maker's Mark bourbon, a rash of Bailey's Irish cream to throw away, Square lumps of frozen water sculpted into the shape of ice cubes. <laughs> and a farewell from newsreader Andrew Harvey, digitally recorded off air. Well, that's the national and international news tonight. Good night. <laughs> While I mix these together, I turn to the debonair doyen of the dance, and I ask, as askingly as I might, this ask. Please, Mr. Music, will you play? <laughs>
soupy twist. twist.